to this, the fifth and uh, well, actually it's the fourth panel, the fifth and final event in the symposium, uh, the academic portion of the symposium, um, entitled "The Anti-Federalists After 200 Years: Pundits or Prophets." I'd like to introduce the moderator for this panel, the Honorable Edwin Meese. Uh, Mr. Meese has spent uh, his career in distinguished service in public life, most recently as Attorney General, the 75th Attorney General of the United States. Currently, he's a distinguished fellow with the Heritage Foundation and holds a chair, a, visit, a distinguished fellowship at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Attorney General Meese. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to again be able to participate in a conference of the Federalist Society. Uh, let me just say one, one word about the Society. Uh, I've had the privilege uh, in the last year to go around to a number of campuses and particularly a number of law schools uh, to speak. And invariably I've heard from law school deans that uh, even though their own politics don't necessarily agree with the predominant philosophy of most members of the Federalist Society, they are uniformly impressed by the organization and particularly the fact that it brings such outstanding speakers and promotes diversity of viewpoints uh, on the law school, at the law school campuses throughout the country. And I think the fact that an organization uh, just barely 10 years old has had the impact on legal education that it has is a great tribute to all of the people, including the excellent committee that's organized this particular conference here today. Well, this morning and this early this afternoon, uh, our first three panels uh, started with the authors of the Federalists and came forward, if you will. Uh, this panel we're planning to turn the telescope around and look back in history uh, to address the topic that, that's in your program there, the anti-Federalists after 200 years of pundits or prophets. Uh, we're going to ask questions in effect uh, like uh, whether or not Samuel Adams was correct when he warned that if the proposed national government was established, as he said, the idea of sovereignty in the states must be lost. Was he predicting the future or only voicing sentiments that have come to naught? Uh, that's why uh, in this panel we hope to look at the ratification of the Constitution as being an occasion for, as you know, a uh, very spirited and sometimes partisan debate. Partisan not in the sense of one party versus another, but partisan as to the particular viewpoints uh, that the various contenders represented, and particularly the viewpoint of the states versus the national government. The anti-federalist opponents of the Constitution uh, predicted in sometimes extravagant terms that the federalists were trying to create a leviathan, in other words, a monster state that would swallow up the liberties and the self-governance of the people. Well, the federalist, as you know, uh, was in large measure an attempt to answer those criticisms. And so now, after 200 years, we can debate uh, who had the better of the argument. Uh, how prophetic or contemporary were the criticisms and the fears of the anti-federalists, or if the anti-federalists today look better than they did 200 years ago, what went wrong with the federalism design? Uh, we brought together a distinguished group of people, but let me at the outset uh, make one observation that's always interested me, and that is that we have come in 200 years uh, from Madison and Hamilton and Jay at the end of the, the 18th century to 200 years later at the end of the 20th century, and we have Biden, Kennedy, and Metzimah. Uh, I will leave to my panelists what the relevance of that is uh, in terms of the anti-federalist's deepest uh, concerns. I will make only one observation which is non-legal, and that is I think it does disprove the Darwinian theory because man obviously does not evolve. We have a number of things that have been talked about in the earlier panels today. For example, uh, we have federal executive branch agencies that are getting far more intrusive than ever before into how people, for example, utilize the land on which they have their homes or their businesses. Uh, we have uh, Congress often accused of acting like a kind of super city council and delving into minutiae that would have been perhaps quite foreign to, the, to the, those who wrote the Federalists. We have the Supreme Court uh, deciding such monumental issues as to whether or not condoms should be sold in pharmacies, uh, 
uh, abortion uh, and the regulation of uh, purported wetlands. And then we have the states uh, that have been precluded by recent decisions from even setting the salaries of their own employees without federal interference. Well, to look back through the reverse telescope, uh, we have brought together uh, three gentlemen here on this panel who all have one thing in common, and that is they were all editors of the Law Review while they were in law school. <laughs> Our first speaker uh, comes to us from, from Yale Law School, and uh, Professor uh, Akhil Amar uh, not only is a professor at Yale Law School now, but he has had his undergraduate and graduate education in that remarkable institution, and uh, he is currently a, a teacher in constitutional law, federal jurisdiction, and related subjects. Uh, he is going to kick off our panel here by looking at the topic from the standpoint of centralization versus local control, participation in government by the ordinary citizen, and how the people at the time of the Constitution particularly viewed the way in which the government would operate, particularly with a concern as to the professionalization of certain types of governmental occupations. It's my pleasure to present to you Professor Amar. I'd like to begin with uh, a couple of words of, of thanks and, uh, and an apology in advance. Uh, the first word of thanks goes to the University of Texas um, and the local chapter of the Federalist Society here for being uh, such wonderful hosts, and we are very grateful. Uh, I also wanted to thank the Federalist Society generally. Um, it's been my privilege to be at uh, several of your events, and uh, and it, it was indeed even be, before those events my, my privilege to uh, go to law school with some of the, the people, the, the folks who, who founded the Federalist Society. And um, I've always learned so much from you. Um, we haven't always agreed about everything, and you all haven't always agreed among yourselves uh, about everything, but uh, I have gotten a tremendous uh, amount from our association, and I'm grateful for that. Um, which leads me to the apology. Um, I've been at several of these uh, symposia before, and uh, I've tried to shake things up a bit, I, I suppose, and say some pretty provocative things, and maybe that's why um, I've been invited back. Uh, alas, um, I'm not sure I'm going to say um, that I have anything quite so provocative or um, such a, a big uh, theme to connect uh, my, my remarks today. Um, at past uh, symposia, just to give you uh, some, some of you uh, newcomers uh, um, a little bit of history, we had a symposium um, that in, in part uh, focused on uh, the amendment process, and I took the position that Article 5 may not specify the uh, exclusive mechanism by which the Constitution can be amended, may not specify the mechanism by which government can amend the Constitution, but that we, the people of the United States, might be able to um, uh, retain, as it were, using the language of the Ninth Amendment, an inalienable right to alter or abolish our government by, by mechanisms not explicitly provided for in Article 5. Um, and uh, that would have some radical implications, for example, for how term limitations might uh, uh, come about or, or other things. It, it's a kind of kooky idea, I think, uh, uh, um, but um, you can at least remember it. Uh, and at least Gary Lawson has been nice enough in, in print to endorse it, and Gary, I thank you for that vote of confidence. Um, uh, at another symposium, which is about property, um, I took the position that private property was such a wonderful thing that uh, everyone should have some. <laughs> and that that might even involve um, certain kinds of uh, redistribution that were not only permissible but uh, constitutionally obligatory under the 13th Amendment. Um, although perhaps not judicially enforceable, uh, happily, um, for the judges in the crowd. Um, last year, uh, we celebrated the bicentennial of the Bill of Rights, and um, I tried to talk, building on, on some ideas that I, I later uh, put out in an article called The Bill of Rights as a Constitution, tried to talk a bit about how the original Bill of Rights integrated both rights and structure, doing for the Bill of Rights, I think, the kind of analysis, um, trying at least, uh, that Jeff Miller uh, invited uh, uh, earlier today, trying to think about how rights affect structure, how structure affects rights, how to think about uh, the two of them together. Um, 
Today, unfortunately, I have some rather smallish um, points about the Anti-Federalists, uh, but towards the end I'll, I'll try to make up for that by uh, making a big claim about moving a little bit away from the, the topic strictly defined, which is the Anti-Federalist topic of this panel, uh, and um, saying something about the general topic of, of this symposium, the Federalist Papers, uh, and the, the, just to uh, anticipate the my, my one big argument at the end, I think it's possible that all of us um, have really missed the biggest argument in the Federalist Papers uh, for Union, and you won't find it in the packet uh, that was circular, you won't find it in 10, and you won't find it in 51 or 78, uh, and uh, it, it has some interesting implications uh, for both Federalist uh, theory and uh, for the Anti-Federalist. Before I get to that, let me just talk a little bit about the Anti-Federalist vision. Um, we're already simplifying a bit because, of course, anti-federalist is the label that um, we've come up with, that folks at the time, indeed, uh, came up with, to lump together um, all the folks who opposed the Constitution. And they may have been opposing the Constitution for different reasons, perhaps for uh, inconsistent uh, reasons, um, just as uh, some members of the, the Federalist Society may uh, agree about what they don't like, uh, but have... Um, uh, sometimes a little bit more difficult time coming up with uh, uh, a complete agreement about what they would like. Um, so we're simplifying a bit, but just to give you, I think, in, in broad uh, sketch, the, the anti-federal, the major set of critiques of the Constitution that emerged from the folks that we call uh, anti-federalists. Um, obviously, um, theirs was a, a vision that celebrated uh, localism or state and local. Uh, control and was very fearful of centralization of, of authority. The revolution, of course, was a revolution that had been fought not simply for freedom, um, but for localism. No taxation without representation was about representation in local colonies, in the local colonial legislature, and so it, it, that, that slogan of the revolution really integrated freedom rhetoric with federalism rhetoric, and the anti-federalists carry on the, the, the tradition of being very suspicious of any central government way off there, um, possibly removed from ordinary constituents now. Whether it's in London or whether it's in Washington, D.C., it's still pretty far removed from the folks back home, and, and there was concern about this uh, new government that was being summoned into existence, possibly simply to replace the imperial yoke that had been cast off only uh, 13 years before. Um, well, did this concern come true, that the, that the Constitution would centralize all authority and displace states? Um, today, I think a lot of us would say yes, uh, that there's not very much left of, of state autonomy. Um, uh, so you could say the anti-federalists were right on that one. But if they were right, they were right, I think, only in the long term, and only because of all sorts of subsequent constitutional changes that, that occurred uh, very far after the founding period. Uh, until the Civil War, um, the federal government doesn't exercise lots of, of power. Um, even if on paper John Marshall is willing to read the Commerce Clause fairly, and other um, uh, clauses in Article I, Section 8 fairly broadly, uh, Congress, um, uh, it, congressional legislation is considerably more uh, restrained. And indeed, even McCulloch may have been not quite as expansive as, as some of us have read it in a post Darby world, post-1937 uh, world. Um, so uh, what really accounts for the centralization? The Civil War, ironically, accounts for a lot of it. Um, a war triggered by an expression of state rights, but that results in uh, a centralization of executive authority, as all wars tend to, and then constitutional amendments that really restrict states, uh, leading to subsequent constitutional amendments that Frank Easterbrook talked about, the 16th and 17th amendments, that have a profound effect on the shift of uh, the balance of power between uh, state government and, and, uh, and the federal government. So those are all sorts of subsequent constitutional developments. And some of them, many of them, really involve the participation of state legislatures that ratified the 16th Amendment or that ratified uh, the 17th Amendment and gave away the store, possibly, uh, that, that, um, that the original Constitution actually had, had kept for them. So I want to agree with everything that uh, Frank said in his uh, very thoughtful uh, and deep, brilliant remarks. Um, and um, agree also with the point that 
um, as the federal, as the constitutional system succeeds actually in creating an integrated national market, more and more um, uh, economic activity really is truly interstate um, in in scope uh, as uh, roads uh, get better, as um, canals are built, railroad, telegraph, and subsequent developments in, in the 20th century uh, uh, revolutionizing communication and um, uh, transportation technology. Um, the, the idea of a common market in a new continent succeeds and uh, uh, has the predictable effect of transferring more power to the um, the central government, which can coordinate that central economy against local um, uh, economic obstruction. So um, some of these changes have occurred because of the, the success of this original um, the vision of a, of a common market uh, for America and others because of uh, subsequent constitutional developments. Second point, so that's centralism versus localism. The second point is the anti-federalists were really very concerned about preserving for ordinary citizens the ability to participate in government. Um, uh, you see that most obviously in, in the idea of the jury, uh, which ordinary citizens would, would be able to, to participate. But they also liked local government better because um, uh, you'd be more likely if you were just a, a, a respectable person in your community, um, uh, very um, solid and um, um, whom others in the community respected, you'd be much more likely to be able to serve in a local government or in a state legislature perhaps than to, to serve in Congress. Uh, this is the flip side of the Federalist number 10, that uh, you're going to just have a lot more refinement of representation at the congressional level than the state level. But what that means is that fewer people will be able to participate in government. And the Anti-Federalists thought that that was a big loss, um, that ordinary citizens would simply become consumers and um, uh, uh, passive um, uh, folk uh, who would basically be ruled by a, a political elite. Um, this point, just to uh, uh, reiterate, the point about ordinary citizen participation is connected to the point about localism. Folk, most folks even today, to the extent that they get involved in politics, are involved at the local level. City council, PTA, um, in the old days they used to muster in local militias um, when you really did have a jury of the vicinage. Um, uh, that was a, a vehicle for ordinary citizens to participate. So there's this connection between state and local government and the idea of citizen participation. That goes along with my third point, um, which is um, suspicion among the anti-federalists of professionalism, professionalism and specialization of labor. Suspicion of uh, professional politicians always in office. So the anti-federalists believed in rotation of office holding. That was one of Thomas Jefferson's two biggest critiques of the Constitution. There's not sufficient rotation of office holding. Uh, that is a term limitation kind of idea. Um, and uh, there wasn't a Bill of Rights. Those are his two criticisms. The jury idea involves rotation. Everyone takes a turn in the jury. Um, the idea that I think Ed Daniels uh, suggested earlier, you serve in the legislature for a while and you get out of it and, and suffer under the laws that uh, you had a hand in, in, in making. There's similar suspicion, not simply of professional politicians, but, but all specialization of labor, which is in tension with an equality idea. And this, again, is Frank Easterberg's point. The more you have specialization of labor, um, the more difficult it is to... Um, that specialization, says Federalist Number 10, breeds inequality, which raises some problems for democracy. And the anti-federalists tended to be uh, Democrats. So, for example, a professional army was very suspicious, because these guys... Were, um, um, would develop uh, their own self-interest that might be inconsistent with those of the community. To put that in modern terms, they were afraid of a military-industrial complex. So they celebrated the, the citizen militia. Um, ordinary folks, um, again local, um, organized around uh, cities um, and, and towns, keeping check on the central standing army. So the militia idea is simply in the military context, the analog of the jury idea. In both cases, locally organized folks participating in government um, and keeping check on these professional folks, whether judges and professional legislators off in Washington, D.C., or professional uh, army soldiers um, in the military context. Uh, and so you have ordinary citizens taking their turn in the militia and, and the jury, keeping check on professional uh, politicians. And once again, you see the state's rights dimension to that. Um, local folks keeping check on, on central folks. Uh, finally, the anti-federalists um, 
thought that the and this is uh, what Doug Laycock and others have been talking about, thought that there was a need in the original Constitution for a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, however, that they wanted was not simply a Bill of Rights to protect individuals or minorities, but also and perhaps even more fundamentally a Bill of Rights to protect states and to protect certain kinds of intermediate um, associations. State rights and individual rights went hand in hand to a considerable degree as the no taxation without representation slogan of the, found, of the revolution suggests the Virginia and Kentucky resolves in which folks organized at the local level to resist the Federal Sedition Act. Um, uh, what's going, what went on in Eastern Europe last summer with um, uh, Yeltsin mobilizing um, uh, forces at the state or, uh, level to combat uh, the central uh, coup that was that was being uh, attempted, and so you had with the Virginia and Kentucky resolves a yoking of First Amendment and Tenth Amendment rhetoric, and indeed the First Amendment argument that they made was in large part a federalism argument. Argument: Congress simply has no enumerated power over speech. That's why it says Congress shall make no law. It's an inversion of the language of Article One, Section Eight's Necessary and Proper Clause. The Congress shall have power to make all laws necessary and proper. And the First Amendment, which reads, unlike every other, says Congress shall make no law. I mean, they just, there's no power over either speech or religion. And speech and religion are, in fact, put together in the original First Amendment, largely for reasons of federalism. There's just no enumerated power over either, in either of these domains. State constitutions do not combine speech with religion. No state constitution does. The federal one does. And you see this integration of of uh, states' rights, as it were, and, and, and libertarianism. Um, you see it again with the Second Amendment talking about both uh, rights to bear arms of, 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 of individuals, perhaps, but also state militias. Um, uh, you see it uh, in the, the Establishment Clause. Um, it's not simply that Congress can't establish a national church. It also can't disestablish a state church. It has no power respecting the establishment of religion. So that was just left to, to, to locals. Now, pulling all of that together um, is once again, just if you want just one central image of the original anti-federalist vision, um, think of the jury, okay? The jury is local rather than central, and you see that especially with concerns about the jury of the vicinage, not just a jury from the state, but from your community. Um, the jury is participatory, and it involves ordinary citizens getting involved regularly in government. The idea here is Tocqueville's idea that the jury is not simply a right of the defendant. It's not simply for the defendant or the party's benefit, but it's about education of the ordinary citizens who serve on it. This is what they, they learn uh, virtue, and, and they learn how to deliberate um, uh, with each other. Um, you see in the jury the suspicion of professionalism. These are ordinary citizens who rotate through. You serve on the jury, and then you're, you're all out. Um, the jury, and, and they, their vision really was the same should be true in the legislature. You should serve a term, and then you should get out for a while and let someone else uh, uh, take, take their shot. Um, and um, uh, you see how this integrates sort of localism and, and um, the rights of the individual, that the two are sort of blended together um, in uh, this jury idea. And the jury idea today, I submit to you, is no longer the central image of our sort of constitutional order. Um, even though it is the dominant motif of the original Bill of Rights, it's in the Fifth, the Sixth, and the Seventh Amendments, you can't understand the First Amendment or the Fourth or even the Eighth without fully thinking about the jury. No prior restraint is all about jury trial, reasonableness and warrants in the Fourth Amendment are all about judge versus jury, even the Eighth Amendment, which says um, there are limitations on bail and fines and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and punishments. Well, that's judges acting without jury. So that's the original vision, uh, but it's not ours, and it's not ours because not so much because the anti-federalists um, were completely right that the federal government was going to destroy all of these things immediately, but because changes occurred subsequently in American society. You had a civil war, precipitated in part by assertion of state rights, uh, in part. And the civil war, unlike the revolution, is a war in which sort of the, the winners are the centralizers and their suspicion of localism. And so the jury as a local body um, becomes uh, less uh, central. Um, uh, you have specialization of labor that increases, um, and that makes lots of people unwilling to take their turn serving as jurors because the opportunity cost um, is so high. 
Um, and you also have in the 20th century the rise of this modern uh, industrial bureaucratic state and claims that because the world is a lot more complicated today, we need professionals. And, and so you have a shift away from, for example, the um, uh, civil jury towards the headless bureaucracy as the um, uh, uh, fashioners of, of rules governing civil society. Um, and that's a feature in part, a reflection of increasing specialization of labor, which is again what I think Frank was talking about. So in the long run, it seems to me that anti-federalists really um, said a lot of things that were right. Um, uh, but they were right only in the very long term, and their concerns that the, federal, that the Constitution um, was going to immediately lead to consolidation and centralization and um, uh, uh, lack of involvement uh, of ordinary citizens uh, didn't occur. The one final point now to conclude um, is this point about the central argument of the Federalist Papers. We today focus on the Federalist number 10 and 51, and Madison's basic idea that you want a central government basically to protect citizens uh, against their own state government, to protect people in Rhode Island against the Rhode Island government, the rage for paper money and all the rest. And of course, that's the 14th Amendment tradition too. And so that's why we focus on the Federalist 10 after the 14th Amendment. No one reads the Federalist 10 before the Civil War as the central Federalist paper. The central Federalist papers and the central argument for union is in Federalist numbers four through eight. And the argument there is that you basically have, and, this, and the reason that this is more um, t uh, accepted is because anti-Federalists as well as Federalists can agree with the argument of four through eight and they don't agree with 10. They like states better than the federal government. But the argument from four, from four to eight is you need a federal government in order to prevent the states from warring with each other, in order to prevent states from having land borders with each other that will lead to the buildup of armies and will lead to strongman military figures, which destroys democracy. So in order to protect democracy, the states have to combine and rely on this moat called the Atlantic Ocean that will protect them against Europe, and they won't need big armies to protect them. Um, and that's the original vision, that you have a, cent a, a, a central government, not so much to protect you against your own state, but basically uh, to protect you against foreign nations and to prevent the states from warring against each other, to protect the citizens of one state from the citizens of another state, not from their own state. And that is a vision that anti-federalists as well as federalists at the founding can agree with. And that's why it's much more central in the Federalist Papers than Publius's um, argument in number 10. And as a conclusion, I invite you to read Federalist uh, number 4 to 8. Uh, I've written a little commentary about it in last year's uh, University of Chicago uh, Law Review. Um, and so th the bottom line, for example, if we look across the water to Europe, um, uh, would be Eastern Europeans should, should think about the jury involving ordinary citizens. Um, in, in uh, government if they take seriously this original anti-federalist idea. But they have to think seriously about the federalist point too, that to really work, um, uh, they need a, con for, for democracy to work in each state, there needs to be a continental system to assure peace um, within all of Europe. And that requires coordinating um, with, uh, with other countries to create um, a demilitarized continent. And that's the federalist vision, create a demilitarized continent. So the anti-federalists say, remember the jury, and the federalists basically say, um, uh, re remember the need for a, a central government um, to, um, to prevent standing armies. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Amar, for an excellent insight into the thinking of the anti-federalists and how it related to the whole debate. Our next speaker uh, is a good friend and for several years was my, literally my right arm at the Justice Department. Uh, Chuck Cooper, who as most of you know, has been very active in various meetings of the Federalist Society. He's a partner in Shaw, Pittman, Potts, and Trowbridge, was the Assistant U.S. Attorney General in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel, and is uh, at the present time, in addition to his uh, very valuable regular law work, engaged in a number of activities for preserving the Constitution, 
including some recent arguments before the Supreme Court. Uh, Chuck will talk about the Federalist and Anti-Federalist conceptions of federalism with particular emphasis on the role of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Please join me in welcoming Chuck Cooper. Thank you very much, Ed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when uh, the organizers of today's event uh, invited me to be with you, they described the uh, program that they were planning to put together and the panel that uh, they planned to include me on. I'm very pleased, of course, to hear that I would be with my old friend Ed Meese and, uh, and my old friend Lino Gralia and the very distinguished professor Akhil Lamar. Uh, I told them I didn't mind at all coming on a panel that was uh, last in the day, even though it has been my experience at Federalist Society events, that that oftentimes dooms you to either being redundant or wrong. <laughs> but I refused to follow Alino Gralia, <laughs> for that would doom me, certainly, to being both bland and moderate. <laughs> I note from the order of the proceedings today that I may not have been the only one with that demand. <laughs> the anti-federalists, as we have learned uh, from, from Professor Amar, didn't agree among themselves on everything. Quite the contrary, but we nonetheless still speak of the anti-federalist position uh, as though there was complete agreement. And I will continue that, uh, that tradition as oversimplified as it is. But the anti-federalists and the federalists didn't disagree on everything either. The federalists and the anti-federalists agreed that the principal purpose of government is to secure individual rights, and that the best instrument for this purpose is some form of limited Republican government. They also agreed, generally, that individual rights and governmental powers are reciprocally related, that they are opposite sides of the same coin. The individual has a right to do anything that the government has no power to keep him from doing. Or to put that another way, if the government has power to regulate on a certain subject, the individual has no right to act contrary to that regulation. Now this understanding of rights and powers was the premise on which the framing of the Constitution was based. By delegating legislative power over certain subjects to the federal government, the people consented to abide by the laws enacted by the federal government over which, uh, with, which pertain to that subject. However, as to those subjects over which the federal government had no delegated le legislative power, the people retained the right, vis-a-vis -vis the federal government anyway, to do just as they pleased. Now the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists disagreed on whether the enumeration of federal powers would by itself serve to restrain the new national government within those powers. And on this question, the stakes were quite high. Any exercise of power beyond those delegated resulted in a concomitant encroachment on the rights of the individual, but also on the sovereign authorities of the states. And this disagreement centered on the need for a Bill of Rights the anti-federalists arguing that the new government could not be trusted to stay within its delegated powers in the absence of an express declaration of reserved rights, while the federalists argued that such a declaration was both unnecessary and also actually dangerous. And the anti-federalists were right, I submit, in their prophecy that the mere enumeration of powers would not protect against federal usurpation, but they were plainly wrong in their belief that a Bill of Rights would work any better. The Federalists believed that the Bill of Rights was unnecessary because the structure of the national government adequately protected the rights of the people. Their structural argument was premised on the notion that the national government would be one of enumerated and therefore limited powers. The Federalist theory, I think, is best illustrated by the position that they took on the proposed amendment protecting freedom of the press. They argued that such an amendment was unnecessary because the national government lacked the power to control the press in the first instance. James Wilson, 
who was a famed uh, Pennsylvania lawyer and one of the foremost opponents of the Federal Bill of Rights, asked this, what control can proceed from the federal government to shackle or destroy that sacred palladium of national freedom? Now he conceded that an amendment would be necessary if, in these are his words, a power similar to that which had been granted to Congress for the regulation of commerce had been granted to regulate literary publications. But since Congress uh, lacked the power to regulate the press, the proposed amendment to the Constitution would be altogether superfluous. Alexander Hamilton viewed the issue precisely the same way, writing in Federalist uh, 84. He asked, why, for instance, should it be said that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed? Now, quite apart from their view that a Bill of Rights would be redundant or unnecessary, the Federalists viewed a Bill of Rights as positively dangerous, and the danger proceeded from the probability that some treasured right would be omitted from the listing. James Wilson, again, uh, explained the matter succinctly in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. If we attempt an enumeration of rights, everything that is not enumerated is presumed to be given. The consequence is that an imperfect enumeration would throw all implied power into the scale of the government and the rights of the people would be rendered incomplete. As Wilson's statement uh, makes clear, the federal spirit that the enumeration of rights might imply that the national government had the power to abridge any right that was not expressly preserved in the Declaration. The framers believed that the people retained the right, vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, to do anything that the national government lacked the delegated power to prevent them from doing, erected a body of rights that was limitless and could not be contained in the list. Uh, Iridell was fond of saying, give me any declaration of rights you like and I will immediately be able to add 30 to it. Now the Ninth Amendment uh, was crafted specifically to respond to the concern that an enumeration of rights retained by the people would imply that the enumeration was exhaustive. As you recall that uh, forgotten amendment provides that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So the Ninth Amendment is simply a rule of construction designed to ensure that the federal government does not exceed its delegated powers. And similarly, the Tenth Amendment, which reserved uh, to the states all powers not delegated to the federal government, was designed, as Chief Justice Stone put it, to allay the fear that the new national government might seek to exercise powers not granted and that the states might not be able to exercise their reserve powers. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest to you that these express reservations of rights in the people and reservations of powers in the states have not had the constraining influence on the federal government's appetite for power. Its founders, especially the anti-federalists, had hoped. When was the last time the Supreme Court held that the Congress had exceeded its powers and thus encroached on reserve rights of the people? In other words, when was the last time to vote the Ninth Amendment? Well, it never has. When was the last time the Supreme Court upheld a state's Tenth Amendment claim that a congressional enactment unconstitutionally encroached on the state's sovereign authority? Well, that has happened, but not in well over 50 years. Let me correct that. It did happen in 1976 in a case called National League of Usury, where the uh, Supreme Court held that uh, the federal government could not regulate the wages and hours of state employees involved in traditional government functions. Now, that modest, almost insulting, uh, <laughs> Uh, concession to states' uh, sovereign authority didn't last long, however, because in 1985 the Supreme Court overruled that in the famous uh, Garcia case. And there the court held that the traditional government function test uh, was unworkable and that in fact any test was unworkable to determine what Congress's Commerce Clause powers were. So the Supreme Court was simply going to let Congress decide the extent of its Commerce Clause powers. So now even the pathetic limit on federal power recognized in us is gone and the Supreme Court will no longer go through the charade that it had for 50 years 
of pretending to inquire into the scope of congressional legislative power. There is literally no area of domestic concern in which the states may legislate without fear of federal interference. They act at the sufferance of Washington. Now, perhaps the state's win-loss record uh, against the Congress should not be surprising when one recognizes that the body responsible for determining the extent of the federal government's powers is the federal government. Another branch of the federal government, to be sure, but still the federal government. And it works in the obvious two-step process. The political branches, as they're called, though the designation really, uh, some would say, uh, fits aptly to the Supreme Court, but the political branches enact the latest encroachment into the state's sovereign powers. And the states run up to the Supreme Court and say, this violates the Tenth Amendment. The Supreme Court says, well, no, no, it doesn't. It's kind of like the coach for the other team calling balls and strikes. <laughs> it, it, it shouldn't be too surprising that, you know, our batters are striking out. But now, I guess after Garcia, the coach isn't going to do it. The pitcher himself will call the ball. <laughs> the now, the Federalists were almost insouciant about the danger of federal encroachment. In Federalist 7, 17, Hamilton betrays a benign, and I would submit a naive, attitude towards the uh, attitudes of federal office holders. Allowing the utmost latitude to the love of power which any reasonable man may acquire, I confess I am at a loss to discover the temptation the persons entrusted with the administration of the general government could ever feel to divest the states of the authorities of that description. The regulation of the mere domestic policy of a state appears to me to hold out slender allurements to ambition. Now later in that same paper, Hamilton makes this assertion. It will always be far more easy for the state governments to encroach upon the national authorities than for the national government to encroach upon the state authorities. Well, in contrast to the Federalists' views on the nature of federal officials and the nature of power, the Anti-Federalists fully anticipated the phenomenon of federal encroachment and usurpation, recognizing that the federal judiciary would play a key role in bringing about, as Robert Yates, writing as Brutus, put it, an entire subversion of the legislative, executive, and judicial powers of the individual states. Now, Brutus recognized, and he was one of the most prominent and influential of the Anti-Federalists, he recognized that in restricting the national legislature's power, the Supreme Court would also be restricting its own powers. He put it this way, every body of men invested with office are tenacious of power. This of itself will operate strongly upon the courts to give such a meaning to the Constitution in all cases where it can possibly be done, as will enlarge the sphere of their own authority. Every extension of the power of the general legislature, as well as of the judicial powers, will increase the powers of the courts, and the dignity and importance of the judges will be in proportion to the extent and magnitude of the powers they exercise. Brutus feared, and I believe rightly, that the Constitution placed too few constraints, and constraints that were too weak, on the power of the federal courts. They were too unaccountable. They were, according to Brutus again, independent in the fullest sense of the word. There is no power above them to control any of their decisions. There is no authority that can remove them, and they cannot be controlled by the laws of the legislature. In short, they are independent of the people, of the legislature, and of every power under heaven. Men placed in this situation will generally soon feel themselves independent of heaven itself. And so Brutus's prophecy came to pass. Uh, I have come to the view that uh, we need to go the congressional term limiters one step further. We need to examine the tenure of the federal bench. Uh, I certainly don't think, see how anything other than a good can come from a healthy re-examination of that tenure. 
I think we should start with life tenure. Thank you. Chuck, thank you very much for your uh, excellent exposition of the situation, particularly as it relates to the individual liberties and the rights of the states under the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. You raised the question in your remarks, though, about uh, why uh, Professor Gralia was left to last. And the answer is we wanted to leave this program on a high note and take advantage of his characteristic optimism in our closing <laughs> panel. Actually, uh, he has agreed to share with us uh, the material from his forthcoming law review article entitled, The, the Anti-Federalist Spheres Were an Overly Rosy Scenario. <laughs> It is really a pleasure to uh, be able to introduce uh, Professor Gralia, uh, his biography. And incidentally, I haven't gone into the, a lot of detail on the biographies because you all have that in front of you on each of the three speakers because they are outstanding each in their own realm. But I do want to say that it's a particular privilege to introduce Professor Gralia. Because I think Lino, uh, with his willingness to work with students and to speak around the country, has had probably one of the most important influences on contemporary legal thought, particularly in relation to constitutional matters, of virtually anyone in the, the law schools and in the academic community. He is a tremendous contributor to the Federalist Society, and I feel it a real privilege to present him to you now. You know? Thank you very much, Attorney General Mays. Uh, if I may begin by commenting on Chuck's last point uh, about uh, moving term limits to lifetime tenure, a point I think it's important to make in that connection is that it's advances in medical science that demand rethinking of monogamy and lifetime tenure. <laughs> <laughs> Two institutions that work better when you were guaranteed everybody died at 40. <laughs> There is no doubt that the Anti-Federalists were correct in predicting that the Constitution would result in an all-powerful central government. Ironically, the so-called Anti-Federalists were really the Federalists, the proponents of a union of states, not directly of people, or anti-nationalists, while the Federalists were really the Anti-Federalists or nationalists. As often happens in politics, the success of the Federalists was due in part to their appropriation to themselves of an attractive label that better described their opponents. <laughs> the Constitution was adopted upon the representation of its proponents that it would create a central government of limited powers relating primarily to trade, finance, def and defense, with most matters of domestic social policy left to the exclusive control of the states. As Madison put it in Federalist 45, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former will be exercised principally on external objects such as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. The state power will extend to all objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives, liberties, and property of the people. How did it happen then that today there is no area of social policy that is beyond the constitutional authority of the national government and no area that is exclusively for the states. How and when did the federalist system on which the nation was supposedly founded come to an end? The candidates for the decisive event in the demise of federalism are many. Beginning with the present and working back in time, covering the first order, a little of what uh, Akil did. Major turning points include the following. The 1954 Brown decision, although shaky and daring at the time, soon came to be seen, at least by academics and other intellectuals, as establishing the superiority of policymaking by Supreme Court justices for the nation as a whole to policymaking by mere politicians on a state-by-state -state basis. The result is that today, states and cities are able to make policy on even so local a matter as vagrancy control, only to the extent permitted by the officials of the national government's judicial branch. 
President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal assumed and asserted centralized power of economic and social control far beyond anything previously contemplated. The Supreme Court's abandonment in 1937 of its attempt to impose constitutional limits on those powers has meant that the legislative authority of the national government would never again, with one minor exception quickly overruled that Chuck just told us about, it would never again be successfully challenged on federalism grounds. 1913 was another very bad year for federalism because it saw the adoption of both the 17th and the 16th Amendments, by which we've also heard something. The 17th, providing for direct election of senators, undermined the contemplated role of the Senate as a protector of state autonomy. The 16th, the Income Tax Amendment, effectively gave the national government unlimited control of the nation's net wealth <clears throat> and virtually unlimited spending power. By extracting money from the states and offering to return it with strings attached, the national government is able to control by promises of reward, some would say bribery, whatever it might be unable or unwilling to control by threat of punishment. Less frequently noted, but also of major importance to the decline of federalism, are the Supreme Court's decisions in Champion v. Ames, the lottery case in 1903, and McCray v. United States, the oleomargarine case in 1904. In the lottery case, the court held that Congress could legislate to suppress gambling, that is, for moral ends, by simply prohibiting the interstate shipment of lottery tickets under the pretext of exercising its commerce power. In McCray, the court held that Congress could do in margarine producers, surely the most despised and oppressed minority in American history, <laughs> by simply imposing oppressive financial tax, uh, an oppressive financial exaction under the pretext of exercising its power to tax. In McCulloch v. Maryland, 1819, Chief Justice John Marshall had said that Congress would not be permitted uh, to use its enumerated powers as a pretext for the regulation of matters that the Constitution left exclusively for the states. Lottery and McRae removed that limit, with the result that there, today there is nothing that Congress cannot do through its powers to tax and regulate commerce if it is willing to engage in a little trickery. Congress has no authority to prohibit kidnapping or prostitution, for example, but that hardly means we have no federal laws on those subjects. It merely means that federal regulation is a bit roundabout. Federal, uh, federal law does not prohibit kidnapping or prostitution. Everybody knows the feds can't do that. But it does prohibit transporting kidnapped persons or prostitutes across state lines because that's just a regulation of interstate commerce. <laughs> Congress has no power simply to prohibit the manufacture and sale of narcotic drugs. But Congress can and does tax them rather heavily, and uh, then it requires the drug dealer taxpayers to file certain forms which it does not make available. <laughs> <laughs> As a professor of constitutional law, it is my job to teach these little slights of hand to a fresh crop of young innocents every year. I'm always amazed, therefore, when I hear complaints about the underhandedness of lawyers. People don't seem to appreciate it takes hard work on my part. <laughs> that it's no small matter to create a constitutional scholar. <clears throat> Surely the climactic events in our constitutional history were the adoption of the 14th Amendment and the Civil War of which it was the product. Although adopted for limited purposes, the guarantee of certain basic civil rights to blacks, the 14th Amendment has become our second constitution, largely replacing the first. In the hands of such skilled operatives as Justice Douglas and Brennan, the 14th Amendment became the means of converting a system of government of the people by the people into a system of government of the people 
by their moral and intellectual superiors, Douglas and Brennan. <laughs> the Civil War established that South Carolina did not have that most important of all rights, the right of disassociation. The right uh, rights recently successfully asserted by the Baltic states. Although the southern states had voluntarily joined the Union, the North had grown so attached to Southerners as to prefer killing them to letting them go. <laughs> Even Patrick Henry, the most ardent anti-federalist and lover of individual liberty, could not have imagined in his worst nightmare that in signing the Constitution, the states created a government so powerful and independent that it would be willing to make and able to make war against them. The loss of the ability to secede was the loss of the ultimate defense of a measure of state independence. From then on, the national government, and particularly the national government's courts, acted with full realization that the states were now helpless before national power. Federalism suffered a serious blow even earlier, when in McCulloch v. Maryland in 1819, the court interpreted Congress's powers so broadly that the practical effect was to abandon judicial review, uh, 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 to abandon the attempt to impose uh, limits uh, by courts, except for the prohibition of pretext usages that was later abandoned in Lowry and McCray. In Gibbons v. Ogden, even five years earlier, the court came very close to holding explicitly that the scope of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause did not present a justiciable question, but only a political question for decision by Congress itself. Finally, it can be argued that the framers of the Constitution never intended to create a federalist system, and that the emergence of a unified central government was inevitable from the beginning. Hamilton and Madison, the principal instigators of the Constitutional Convention, favored a totally unified government, certainly the case of Hamilton, or something very close to it, in the case of Madison at the time. Madison shrewdly arrived at the convention with a plan for a unified government already in hand. It provided for a complete national government with its own legislature, executive, and system of courts. Instead of enumerated powers, it would have simply given Congress the power to, quote, legislate in all cases to which the separate states are incompetent, unquote. And it provided for a congressional veto of state legislation. The remainder of the convention was largely a process of placing or appearing to place limits on the powerful centralized government Madison's plan contemplated. The problem, of course, was to obtain ratification. In order to do so, Hamilton and Madison and other proponents of the Constitution represented that the new central government would be limited to a few enumerated powers, and that the states would remain the primary units of government in regard to domestic affairs, as in the quote I began by reading. It was obvious to the anti-federalists, as it should have been to everyone, that this was not so. The national government's enumerated powers might be described as few, but they were obviously vast and potentially all-embracing. And no attempt was made to state limits on their scope. For example, Congress was, not, Congress was given the unlimited power to regulate commerce among the states, not merely the power to remove state-imposed impediments to interstate trade, which was the problem that primarily led to the Constitution and the Convention. If the ratifiers of the Constitution actually believed Hamilton and Madison that the new central government would have only limited power and that the states would remain partly autonomous, political wisdom and sophistication were not nearly as widespread among the founding generation as we have been led to believe. Patrick Henry and Samuel Adams uh, certainly had no illusions on this score. The Anti-Federalists have indeed proven to be prophets in predicting that the new national government would be all-powerful, but it was hardly a difficult call. Federalism, I might note in closing, has always suffered 
like the general interest in limiting government spending from the inescapable political reality that it is extremely difficult to overcome the forces of focused special interests with a principle, no matter how attractive and valuable. Imagine, for example, that Doris Day, noted for her commendable solicitude for the welfare of animals, has come to Congress to urge the adoption of federal legislation protecting the interests of cats and dogs. But Ms. Day, someone might object, don't you think that in our federalist system, the welfare of cats and dogs is a matter appropriately left for the states? Senator, she might reply, I yield to no one in my enthusiasm for federalism. But do you know how those cats are suffering? <laughs> this is a special case in which local control will not do and national action is imperative. Even so ardent the proponent of federalism as President Reagan signed the legislation creating a national minimum drinking age, which would seem to be about as local a matter as one could get. This is a problem, President Reagan declared at the signing ceremony, quote, bigger than the individual states, unquote. The only problem that is not bigger than the individual states, unfortunately, is a problem in which one has no interest. Thank you. <laughs> Point us on your rosy scenario. Uh, at this point, uh, we have some time for questions. If uh, those of you who have questions would line up at the microphones, and uh, while while you're doing that, uh, let me just ask all members of the panel: Does anybody have any ideas how the uh, direction in which you have described uh, the country going, uh, depending on what point you take it up, uh, from? Uh, 1814 or later uh, <laughs> has, uh, uh, has been going. Does anybody have any suggestions on how this trend might be slowed down, uh, let alone reversed? Now, I could continue the talk, in essence, by giving a nun idea or a nun helpful. Uh, it's about as helpful as I see. This microphone has a big button here, it's a glass and it's got a sign under the button saying, this button does nothing. I think I would uh, depart from my uh, friend uh, Chuck Cooper, who uh, suggested that the, Gar the Supreme Court's decision in Garcia overruling Ussery uh, changes the uh, ball and strike calling from the coach to the pitcher. And I gather he's complaining about that. And I would like to not complain about it. That is, I mean, as he said, really, I mean, I think he himself gave it away when he said, well, uh, this ended what had previously been the farce for 50 years of the court purporting to impose limits on federal power. Well, I think it's a good thing when farces are ended. And the only alternative along that line is that the farce continue. That is, that is, the Supreme Court is not going to limit congressional power, and in my view, it shouldn't. I would rather not be saved than be saved by Harry Blackman. <laughs> and if it's not going to limit power, which it isn't, it isn't, and I, don't, I think it appears that it can't, that's what it tried to do in the, the New Deal in the 30s, and uh, nearly uh, had its uh, uh, head handed it. Unfortunately, it escaped. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but it, I think that, that established to most people's satisfaction that it can't do it even if it wants to, and there is uh, little interest in doing so. That being the case, it seems to me it is better for the court to not to pretend to review federal legislation on federalism grounds but instead make perfectly clear that the entire responsibility is in Congress. Because now Congress passes laws, you say it's unconstitutional, the Supreme Court will take it. The Supreme Court will review that, and then it gives it this pretend review. Garcia, to some extent, removes some, not entirely all of the pretense, and I think it would be better uh, if it removed all the pretense. That is, uh, we 
cannot, we should not, and in any event cannot, rely on the court as the answer to this. Uh, and uh, so that's my non answer. Thank you. Several people over the course of, uh, of this conference have alluded to the um, 17th Amendment, which um, shifted from uh, state legislative selection of, of senators to, to direct election. Uh, when, you, when that shift occurs, um, ordinary voters uh, are going to be, um, as it were, uh, Doris Days. They're going to focus on uh, particular policy outcomes that, that they want. And if someone who's running for the Senate pro promises them, the voters are less likely to weigh against the immediate policy objective that is promised, the long-term structural cost of shifting of power from the state governments to the central government. Uh, that long-term structural interest is more likely to be uh, taken seriously by state legislatures than it is by ordinary voters out of um, self-interest, the Madisonian uh, idea in 51 of ambition checking ambition, or to uh, um, uh, uh, invoke uh, uh, Richard Epstein's remarks uh, yesterday, uh, people who had um, positions in state government were often a little more skeptical of the original constitution because it was going to take power away from them and give it to the central authority. So, uh, uh, this is, of course, perfectly consistent um, uh, rethinking of the 17th Amendment um, with the idea that um, if uh, it were uh, rethought and, um, and uh, direct el uh, election were uh, uh, eliminated, uh, perhaps the Senate would be a little bit more um, uh, sensitive to the concerns of state governments than it is as currently constituted. One final point, even before the 17th Amendment, this shift was taking place um, under what uh, was called the Oregon system. A lot of times state legislatures would choose, basically, in effect, to give their proxies, or to, 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 to uh, let the voters of the state d decide the thing. Uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, of course, are taking place under the old regime, um, but there are all sorts of um, beauty contests and, and other things in which the ordinary citizenry is in effect voting and the legislature is rubber stamping uh, the result of the direct election in much the same way as the Electoral College works today. So even before the 17th Amendment, some state legislatures were giving away the store. Uh, but I, I, and, and so if we, that were to be rethought, I suppose it would have to be yoked with possibly a non-delegation idea that state legislatures shouldn't be permitted possibly to, um, to give up that, that um, uh, role. Chuck? I certainly agree with you, Lino, that uh, that the Garcia case did end a charade, as I, as I mentioned, and I, and I think uh, that if it's going to be a charade, I'd prefer to see the, I prefer to see it ended and the uh, and Supreme Court get out. I don't uh, entertain any uh, illusions that uh, that my policy preferences will be saved by Harry Blackman. Uh, but uh, I disagree on whether I want the Supreme Court out of that. I mean, I don't want it back in. Uh, in, in the charade that it was, uh, but I but I, I would find it uh, uh, most uh, gratifying if the Supreme Court would take seriously the structural limitations on federal power, uh, as it does the uh, the express uh, limitations in some of the other amendments, and would simply say, on the issue of dogs and cats. Uh, this is not where you get that issue decided. Just go back and decide that in the states. <clears throat> that way, the good people of Massachusetts may decide it one way, the good people of Texas may, may decide it another. And that's exactly the genius of, of federalism and the notion that uh, uh, where Doris Day lives, she may well be able to convince her, uh, her uh, fellow citizens that, uh, that her concerns should be theirs and that uh, she should win as a matter of policy. But in somewhere else, uh, maybe, maybe she will not uh, succeed in that. How can we bring that about? I've never thought the 17th Amendment was a particularly uh, muscular uh, method for returning any uh, truly meaningful uh, substance to uh, a federal system. I do think that uh, great strides have been made over the course of the last 12 years, uh, under uh, many of them under Ed Meese's uh, great leadership to uh, bring about some of that change. Uh, and I think. Uh, 
I think the, the best indication is the Supreme Court just took a case from, uh, I think, New York, in which uh, a Tenth Amendment is quite uh, explicitly uh, articulated, uh, Tenth Amendment uh, challenges explicitly articulated in the cert petition to uh, federal uh, regulation in the area of uh, disposal of uh, nuclear uh, materials. Uh, 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 Justice Rehnquist suggested in his dissent in Garcia that uh, perhaps uh, the day will come when he is uh, surrounded with enough uh, like-minded colleagues that indeed the Tenth Amendment will, will regain some uh, minimal substance, at least something uh, uh, bordering on the crumb that was thrown to the states and National League cities uh, versus us. Beyond that, I, I will conclude by simply saying that I really don't think that there's that that the composition of the court is should be the ultimate answer. Although uh, uh, I I think that in the short term it, it must be uh, because uh, uh, I think that uh, Brutus may well have had it right. Uh, the fact is that uh, the next regime will uh, undo whatever this one does, just as this one will undo whatever the last one did. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, I doubt that federalism will, under, under any regime, frankly, will ever have a significant uh, constitutional dimension until such time as, as there is some restraint external to uh, the grave uh, or in addition to the grave on the people's ability to uh, uh, recall or otherwise influence uh, their judges. Let me make one comment uh, uh, on this, uh, which is uh, no less pessimistic than the, uh, what we've heard here. Uh, but it seems to me that one of the problems right now with exerting any political resistance to this direction is the fact that too many local officials, both governors and mayors and, and their uh, legislative counterparts, have given up the fight. Uh, because it is, as you say, the court's not going to do it. It's essentially a political struggle. And uh, too many mayors are now approached Washington with their tin cups, uh, seeking a pittance from the federal treasury, and too many governors are willing to give up on uh, taking on their responsibility for welfare and some of the other things that have traditionally been left to the states uh, in view of having the government pay a higher share of it. So in effect, uh, when local officials are essentially bribed, as uh, was suggested earlier uh, by uh, uh, Professor Gralia as the result of some of these things, and when there is no political resistance, uh, unless something changes in the near future, it seems to me we're going to have more of the same rather than less, no matter what institutions may be involved. I, I dimly make out somebody at the microphone there. Uh, would you uh, ask your question, please? Uh, well, I have a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, it seems to me that, that uh, lo while localism has a certain attraction, to call it a principle that is overridden by people's immediate interests and in other things probably overstates its coherence as a principle. Uh, if, if Mr. Gralia believes that the ultimate uh, uh, force behind localism is the power of secession, then it seems to me the Federalists are right. That is, there is no consistent uh, anti-Federalist position that can simply give a sufficient uh, you know, autonomy to the states. I mean, you have to make a choice. Either you have independent states or you have a nation. And, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, faced with the alternatives as Mr. Gralia presented them, uh, one would choose to have the states instead. Uh, I would like to also defend the Federalists against the charge of misleading campaigning. Uh, it, it is true that they said the federal government's objects are limited, but they admitted that the federal government's powers are unlimited, especially the very important power to tax, which was not limited to tariffs, but uh, basically unlimited uh, direct taxation proportional to, uh, to population. Uh, and the power to uh, maintain a standing army. I mean, these are very forthright admissions that this is what it takes to have a national government, and, uh, and we're going to decide to have that. Uh, finally, I mean, I think the Federalist uh, probably is vindicated in saying that the distinction between the federal and the state governments is not going to be maintained by an enumeration of powers. It's not something that can be enforced judicially. Uh, Hamilton says the people will be more trustful of the states, but he says a few papers later, if the people later change their minds, uh, they are free to place their confidence where they find it merited. 
in a way, one of the problems is that the federal government uh, came to seem uh, trustworthy enough that perhaps now the people are, are overly trusting. But the, basically, I think the Federalist presents it as a political question and that the question of, of which uh, government has what powers depends ultimately on which government the people would like to have those powers. And uh, I mean, why isn't that a reasonable way of settling the distinction? Okay, we have uh, a number of points there, and uh, we'll let each of the panelists to speak to those. Uh, Professor Crowley, you want to go first? I uh, don't uh, much disagree with your first point, which uh, that is amounts to saying that it, it may be that it in fact is not possible to divide sovereignty. And how are you going to? The whole idea may well may well have been misguided or the more sophisticated may have realized that only one result could eventuate from this arrangement, namely a totally centralized government at the decision of the federal government, which is not necessary, necessarily to be complained of if the decision of the federal government is pursuant to the wishes of the people, as it seems to me was very much the case with the New Deal, a major step in this direction, then the people have decided to have a more centralized government. But it may be, I, I suspect it is, that you can't divide sovereignty. A lot of people, political theorists, said you can. And if the American experience, I think, is a, uh, a, a good indication to any budding federalist systems or would-be federalist systems, that it may, may well be it can't be done. When Margaret Thatcher is learning that if the European community, or was learned, if the European community has the power to regulate commerce, they will soon may be making law, rules about sex discrimination. And I say, well, that's, that's old hat over here. That's, that's what happened. <laughs> and so it may be that, that that's right. And that it was when I say, when they lost, when it was clear they lost the power to secede, before, as long as it wasn't clear that they could secede, the threat of secession was, was an ample defense. And it may well be when that was gone, there was no defense. For, uh, for better or for worse. I think it would be, it is in, disingenuous though to think that you say, well, the powers were limited or few. I mean, obviously those powers, it, uh, the, again, the, uh, Chuck said that the um, anti-federalists were not right. They were right about the Constitution giving a centralized government. They were not right about the Bill of Rights being a limit. Well, I think an important qualification of that is that the anti-federalists didn't get the Bill of Rights they wanted. Again, the Bill of Rights was in the hands of this new national government. Again, if, if this doesn't look like a high degree of political sophistication to me, the guy said, this government's too strong, we need a Bill of Rights. They said, okay, you, you let us have a government and we'll give you a Bill of Rights. And you, you can count on it. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's not what I call a shrewd negotiation. Uh, and they nearly got no Bill of Rights. That is, uh, when uh, the government was formed, a lot of people thought that there were more important things to be get going than worrying about adding a few obviously empty moral aphorisms uh, to the document. Uh, but uh, Madison took it seriously that he uh, uh, had made this promise and darn, he's gonna give him a Bill of Rights. And he gave him a Bill of Rights that largely had the opposite effect. That is, the, because the uh, Articles of Confederation said that power is not expressly granted, as was already mentioned, were reserved, Patrick Henry insisted that, that he expressly has to be in there. Indeed, the, the amendments they wanted were amendments that would have defined the powers. I mean, Patrick Henry and Samuel Adams knew exactly what was happening. Uh, they may have simply and realistically been in the same position we are. People who have it right, but who are a minority. who can't get their way. <laughs> I mean, I know what to do about all these problems. Get more people to agree with us. But, but they won't. They're not nearly as benign and insightful. Uh, the, uh, well, Patrick Henry wanted, for example, it seems to be a minimum necessity, if you want to prevent, you want to create a common market to prevent impediments into state trade, give the federal government the power to prevent impediments into state trade. Don't say you can give commerce, regulate commerce among the states. And with the power to tax, uh, it has to find some manner of limitation, such as that you can't take money out of the state just to put it back with strings. Now that's what, what Henry wanted, and he certainly wanted a provision that required that the uh, powers granted be expressed. 
And when Madison deliberately refused to put an express, he knew all he was doing was giving his uh, political colleague, Marshall, grounds for arguing that the federal government isn't limited. Because look, they took out express. So the Bill of Rights they got was worse than no Bill of Rights in terms of protecting federalism. Chuck? Uh, I, I think that you can divide sovereignty. I, I, I think that the separation of powers uh, is a division of sovereignty, uh, like any other uh, uh, jurisdictional uh, separation uh, that, that, one might, uh, that one might think of. What I think you can't do is divide sovereignty on paper uh, and expect uh, those with no, uh, with, without the authority in their own hands to protect their sovereignty, whatever it is, to have that sovereignty at the end of the day, whether it takes one day or 200 years. Uh, I, think that, uh, I think that was the central uh, miscalculation by the anti-federalists uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, recognizing the, uh, the Bill of Rights as some kind of uh, enforceable uh, method for ensuring that the states uh, would prevail as they argued their case in the, in the federal government. In other words, I, I certainly agree with the second point, and I think they're related, and that is that uh, the notion of enumerated and therefore limited powers is not a judicially enforceable method for dividing sovereignty. But I don't think that is to say that, that, that uh, there is no enforceable method uh, uh, available. I think that, uh, uh, for example, this, with respect to separation of powers, each one of the branches has very substantial tools in its own hands to protect its sovereignty, its jurisdiction. However, uh, the Ninth Amendment is nothing but words. And when the people perceive that their retained rights have been invaded by the federal government because the federal government has legislated a rule of law for them that the, the people did not consent uh, on, on a subject of which the people did not consent to, to be regulated on at the federal level, uh, then there is uh, no method uh, other than uh, 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 the, the method that we've been discussing, term limits with respect to, uh, for the people to reclaim that sovereignty, the same is true of the states. There's no method in the states, no tool in their own hands. Yes, they can amend the Constitution, but we have seen that that, is, uh, that was a theoretical uh, a check on usurpation of, of, of state sovereignty. Uh, I think that uh, there, there may be other methods out there, however, to enforce divisions of sovereignty. The people of California, uh, when repeatedly their efforts uh, failed uh, at, in their attempt to uh, uh, impose uh, the ultimate punishment because of their state court, the Supreme Court's repeated uh, uh, usurpations of power, at least, in the, at least in the minds of the citizens of California, uh, found in their possession a tool with which to enforce their sovereignty. And it seems to me that uh, one of the best things that ever happened to the California judiciary was the day that Rose Bird and company was recalled. Um, I remember once uh, at another uh, Federalist Society symposium giving uh, some remarks and Lino came up afterwards and said uh, that he agreed with every word and that made me a little nervous. Um, so I told him I'd have to rethink my position. Uh, and I was a little nervous on, on this panel because I thought we might all uh, agree and not give you all your money's worth, um, especially because I think each of us up here has a considerable amount of sympathy for the anti-federalist vision and uh, for, for, for states' rights. Um, but I think, Lena, you said some things that I, I think I, I do disagree with. Um, um, and uh, so uh, I, I was also made a little nervous when I noticed that on, on one side of this card is my name and on the other is Lino's. Uh, so, 
So, you know, let me just um, uh, distance myself from uh, three things that you said. Um, one is um, a, a point about Madison being a complete centralizer and possibly political duplicity in the, the ratification process. Madison did want a completely consolidatious nationalist government at the Philadelphia Convention. He proposed it, um, a, a veto, a congressional veto of every, every state law, um, and he lost. And he was a good loser and a fair loser and was willing to abide by the compromise that he knew that he had to make at Philadelphia and that he would continue to have to make to get the Constitution uh, ratified. Um, he defends the idea that the federal government shouldn't be limited to those powers expressly granted to it, and he talks about that, I think, in number 44, the Necessary and Proper Clause, and so he, he's consistent when he refuses to put that in the Tenth Amendment later on. But this is someone who does take states' rights seriously after the Philadelphia Convention. He votes against the National Bank in the first Congress on Tenth Amendment life. Tenth Amendment isn't, of course, ratified yet, but federalism grounds it. There's no enumerated uh, power here, so it's a little, uh, I think, uh, it's not quite right to say, to call him and Marshall political colleagues. Um, Marshall is, it, um, I mean, is on the other side of that. He, um, 10 years after the Constitution is, is ratified, leads up, heads up the Virginia and Kentucky resolves, claiming that Congress has no power to pass a federal sedition act. It's absolutely outrageous, he says, that the complete, uh, um, contradi completely contradictory the representations that the Federalists made. So he's consistent on that. Marshall, on the other hand, says, well, maybe Congress has the power, but it was politically unwise. Um, as president, he vetoes some road bills, I think, in 1815 uh, that he thinks are beyond Congress's power, even though he thinks they're very good policies. So, so Madison, it seems to me, uh, does take uh, seriously uh, states' rights. Maybe Hamilton didn't. Uh, maybe Jay didn't. But, uh, but I think I want to uh, agree with Mr. Epstein and, and acquit Madison of, of a certain charge of, of uh, uh, duplicity. Now, what does he... He's willing to say, look, we need an necessary and proper clause, but states have certain checks, and they're not just parchment barriers. And this is my second point in response uh, to Mr. Cooper. Um, and he says in the Federalist number 45, it's picked up uh, in the Political Safeguards of Federalism, uh, uh, in the classic article by Professor Wester. He says, well, one of the things that they have, in addition to the paper check of the enumeration of powers, is state governments have this check. It's called the Senate, and they're able to elect senators, and they should they, they have some power, therefore, through the selection of senators uh, to thwart things that threaten the, the, the systematic interests of, of state governments as such. That takes us back to the, 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 the 17th Amendment. Uh, point before. Um, so he's willing to try to not only enumerate some things, but, but provide a check. Finally, on secession, uh, Leno says that, um, uh, that the states lost the right of secession that implicitly they had under the original Constitution. Now, I know in the Lone Star State, these are, these are fighting words that I'm about to <laughs> utter. And indeed, um, I've written a lot about secession, and I, I got into it in a conversation a stone's throw from, from, from here in an argument with Sandy Levinson, literally in the shadow of that monument in front of the, uh, the state capitol that says something about die for states' rights, um, you know, the, Confederate, the monuments of Confederate war dead, which spouts a lot of stuff about secession and its consistency with the original Constitution. And I'm uh, unfortunately here to tell you that uh, Mr. Lincoln was right on that one. Um, <laughs> that, um, that one of the best arguments that the Federalists could have made in order to get folks to sign on is, look, join our club. If you don't like it, you can always leave. And not a single Federalist ever says that. That's falsifiable. Go out and find me one. Um, but they don't say that. They do say, count on the Senate in number 45, that the powers are enumerated. And Madison takes that seriously. They talk about filtration in Federalist 10 and, and bicameralism and, and, and separation of power. They never say secession is a check. Um, on the contrary, in the Federalist number 11, you will see Hamilton refer to the need for a, quote, strict and indissoluble union. It, they're, they're not hiding the ball here. They're saying that's what we need um, and, and their reasons uh, for that. Um, uh, and in fact, Patrick Henry not only wouldn't have been surprised by that, I can give you the quotation from Eliot's debates in which he warns folks in Virginia 
look, be very careful about ratifying this document because if you ratify it, a majority of the people of Virginia who now have a right to, to, to go their own way will lose that right by ratifying this document. Um, and, um, and so all the anti-federalists actually are willing to say, we don't like this because we won't be able to take our balls and, and go home if, if we don't like federal policies. The federalists agree with them that they won't have that right, but try to defend why they shouldn't, largely for geostrategic reasons, because if the South can secede, then who's going to control the mouth of the Mississippi River, and are you going to have wars between North and South over commerce and all the rest? Some of the geostrategic arguments of the Federalist 4 to 8, is, which I mentioned earlier, is absolutely on point on the secession question. And once again, I think we've ignored some of those geostrategic arguments about how if a state had the right to secede, that would threaten possibly the liberty and prosperity and, and democracy of the other states that would remain, because then those guns in Fort Sumter would be able to be turned the other way. Um, and that's a threat to the other states. Chuck, you have a uh, just, a, just a footnote, really. Uh, I think uh, Akil has made a very important point, uh, although not the secession point. In Texas, to be sure. Uh, the, the, the point about unenumerated powers being an enforceable judicial construct, I, I said I agree that it is that it is not, uh, but but that's just because it's uh, it's written, and that's uh, and that's all. I, I think that uh, Akil has pointed out that in the uh, Kentucky and the Virginia resolutions, the uh, principal objection, the foremost number one Roman numeral one point that Madison made, was that there is no power in the federal government to enact the Sedition Act, not until he had at great length. Uh, demonstrated that I think quite convincingly that he even get to the First Amendment and the fact that if there had been power, if you could find it implied somewhere, in the necessary and proper clause or elsewhere, the First Amendment clearly negates it. So it is it, it is judicially enforceable, but it requires the the uh, collision of two extremely unlikely events: one that the question be submitted to uh, an impartial tribunal. And on these questions of power, federal and state, the Supreme Court is certainly not that. Second, it requires that the majority on that impartial tribunal be intellectually honest. And that has, I know of no instant in our country when we've had uh, that uh, uh, event. I'd like to say, if I may, uh, as to Akil's two points. As the first, uh, uh, the uh, extent to which uh, a consolidated government was uh, contemplated, I think the asserted disagreement that, he asserted, that uh, Keel made is, is greater than, uh, than the actual disagreement. That is, he agrees that Marshall, uh, that Madison rather, went into the convention with a, a plan for a centri totally centralized, unified government. And that was essentially my point. And that's, well, that was definitely the way Hamilton and Madison were thinking at that time. And then they knew that they had to make, uh, they had to play that down, let's say, to obtain ratification. Or whether or not that's duplicity or just ordinary political behavior. Now, it happens, of course, uh, that uh, Madison had a remarkably varied uh, political career, varied political views, and then joined with uh, uh, Jefferson in the uh, uh, Virginia Kentucky resolutions, the ultimate expressions of, uh, of state sovereignty. It's hardly the same person who brought in the uh, plan for the, uh, the original plan for the Constitution. So I don't see any disagreement there. Now, on secession. But, but Lena, you know, back then, there was a Constitution. He wasn't just arguing for what it should be, he was trying to interpret what it was. Excuse me. Oh, you mean by the time of the Virginia Kentucky resolutions, he was interpreting it? Yes. Well, he wasn't simply arguing for a better. Well, it, it would appear that the interpretation he was giving at that time was a, ra a very different approach than what he was arguing for at the convention. But, but not in the Federalist Papers and not in the ratification period. He wanted more, he didn't get it, and then when he didn't get it, he played by the rules oh, and, I... and was consistent, I'm claiming, throughout um, his, his post constitutional career. It's not simply 10 years later, it's 
voting against the National Bank on the ground that there's no enumerated power. I, I don't before, that we, before we let the uh, jury decide on the duplicity of Madison, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let me speak let's, just let's let's a second. Uh, one one, back to the one back. Uh, fast content. Again, we, you, we can talk of things in, in legalistic or theoretical ways or in practical ways. The, the fact was that after the Constitution was adopted and it enjoyed a, a very wide, almost immediate acceptance, very, despite the very close debates, however, it was clearly the case thereafter that a disgruntled state or more likely region or group of states would raise the cry of secession. And secession came up in the early times more from the North and the Northeast than from the South. And it was a legitimate question about whether they uh, could secede. It was certainly a legitimate question about whether the remaining states would and should organize military force and make war upon them to prevent it. And if it is the case that that was contemplated, it seems to me it is clear that the Constitution was a mistake. If, this, if, the, if the Civil War resulted from the Constitution, and it did, then the Constitution was a mistake. Now, perhaps the mistake was not a necessary one, but if it was a necessary one, then, sh then surely it was a mistake. Any political arrangement and agreement that leads to that result, 660,000 American deaths, for what? Was a very bad mistake. And Patrick Henry saw that, of course and others didn't understand it or believe it. I take it, because I take it that no sensible person would say, yes, that's what will happen, and let's do it. <laughs> Question over here. Um, I'd like to change the topic a little bit and direct my question to the entire panel. We've talked about, in the last two days, the intrusion of the federal government into states' governments and the erosion of federalism as a, as a form of government. Uh, and I don't think we've really addressed the problem of uh, the tyranny of uh, state governments at times. As uh, any uh, New York State resident can tell you, the state governments can often overstep their bounds <laughs> uh, quite a bit. So my question is that uh, just because people vote away their freedoms in local elections, it doesn't make the, um, the loss of freedom any more shocking. So who are the people in these states who recognize that they're losing their freedoms to turn to, if not the federal legislature or the federal judiciary? Okay, uh, who wants to lead off on that? Chuck? Not Neil Bayline. <laughs> well, well I, think, I think they should turn to the federal uh, judiciary with respect to those issues that the Constitution clearly uh, prohibits the states from uh, uh, legislating on. Uh, if there's an ex post facto law that they're complaining about, they should go to the federal judiciary. If it's uh, a, a, uh, something that uh, abridges their right to contract, they should go to the federal judiciary. However, if it, if it is a, a, a right that they possess under their constitution, then they go to the state judiciary. Under the state constitution. Under the state constitution, of course. And, and if it's a general legislative thing imposing on their uh, on their liberties, uh, they always have the power themselves of gathering like-minded people and voting the rascals out. Uh, as Chuck said, uh, that was done in California in regard to Rose Byrd and her colleagues. It was also done in Proposition 13, limiting taxes. So the, there are political solutions as well as judicial solutions. But, but, but they also have something else which I think is absolutely fundamental, which national citizens do not. Or, uh, they, they are able to leave that community and go to a place where uh, the, the prevailing views on dogs and cats are to their liking. If the, if the national legislature enacts the rule, or worse still, five robed members of the Supreme Court enact the rule that will control throughout the country on dogs and cats, then there's nowhere left to go. Okay, over here. Oh uh, yes, uh, my question, uh, is uh, in light of the assertion made this afternoon that the anti-federalists were correct, and I do believe this assertion has been made incontrovertibly, and that the federal government would usurp all manner of state and individual rights, uh, I have the following question, and this is directed most specifically to the uh, two members or two former members of the federal law enforcement community. Um, since uh, one of the most distinguished federalists of American history, George Washington, was a grower of marijuana. 
since Thomas Jefferson <laughs> was an importer or smuggler of marijuana seeds, and since uh, Benjamin Franklin published some of his revolutionary pamphlets on uh, paper made from him. How, uh, how do you reconcile your allegiance to the views of our forefathers with the fact that you want to put them in prison? <laughs> To tell you the truth, at the federal level, I don't want to put them in prison. I, I, I think there are more, uh, or at least there are plenty of violations of the principles that, uh, that I'm here to defend in the criminal code of the federal in 18 USC uh, than, than perhaps anywhere else. Uh, I don't, however, think that the very compelling historical evidence that you've advanced <laughs> would protect uh, the uh, descendants of uh, those particular founders from, uh, from a criminal prosecution at the state level, however. Okay. Do we have one more question over here? Over here. I'd like to return to the uh, earlier discussion about the nature of government today and how the Federalist vision was enacted and the Anti-Federalist vision was dead on. Certainly today, the federal government controls much more of society than it did 200 years ago. But if we look at on a comparative basis and look at true national governments in other parts of the world, those governments control their citizens' lives much more than our government does. And certainly with no power diffusion that could possibly oppose any decisions that government makes when most national governments appoint their subunit he region heads. That's different from elected government officials at state and local levels in our country. So on this claim that the anti-federalist vision that there would be a strong central national government mandated by the Constitution seems to me to be overstated. I'd like the panel to address that, and also the point about viewing the federal government as a monolith. After all, the Reagan administration, holding the executive branch, fought with the democratically controlled Congress and the uh, Brennan Court or the uh, Supreme Court as well on many issues. And why should we be viewing the federal government as a unit rather than as three separate branches that can, in fact, compete with each other and have different vi visions about what? the permissible role of the federal government is in our nation's life. And to concede on these two points, is that not to uh, suggest that the anti-federalist nightmare scenario was a little overstated? And the federalist vision is actually pretty accurate. Well, on the first point, the anti-federalists are right in that it is the fact today that we have consolidated government. There's no federalism limitation on the power of the national government. That's correct. I think that was inevitable, and it could not have been unforeseen by anyone who tried to see it. Uh, now you say that it is the case that other countries have totally centralized, or if possible, more centralized, and that may well be, I mean, and that's it's certainly true that other countries have uh, centralized governments and don't even pretend to have otherwise. Again, with this, if all it's been reduced to is this silly pretense. I train people in how to do tricks, how to go to Congress and say phony things that can't be done, that can be done, but not honestly. And if they're in France, they wouldn't have to know these tricks. They just do them. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's what federalism is amounted to. You need more lawyers because they're good at tricks. <laughs> we do know that in this country, you have more personal freedom than you do elsewhere in the world. And the point I would like to uh, see you respond to is that the fact, this empirical fact of more freedom is a consequence of federalism, division of power at different levels. And if we had actually started this country with Madison's vision, that the degree of personal freedom today would be not different from what's experienced in, say, Europe and other uh, advanced industrialized nations, but in fact would be the same. Well, I agree we have a, a high degree of personal freedom. I don't think that the centralization of the uh, of power in the national government uh, has, uh, has, been a, has necessarily contributed to that. I think, indeed, that uh, I go along with Doris Day, that I yield to no one in my appreciation of, of federalism. Uh, that indeed, probably the best protections for individual security is not 
uh, builds the rights, which means that people like Brennan get to tell you, and that's the opposite of freedom. <laughs> it is that people actually can control through regular elections who their governors are, and do it on as local a basis as is feasible. I think those are your protections. Chuck, you want to add a point? And then I feel yes, just very briefly. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think the founders understood freedom or rights uh, along the lines I suggested earlier. That is the ability to be free of a governmental regulation that prescribes how you should act or behave with respect to any certain matter. Uh, they believed that, that we would have many freedoms and rights that were not articulated anywhere vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. That the federal government would not be able to regulate us on these questions. That, that, that there were only a few specific freedoms that uh, the, the founders understood we would have with respect to our state governments. With respect to state governments, the citizens were free to create their own relationships with their state governments. And as to those things, they consented to the state governments uh, to, to, to be regulated on, then that's, that's the way that would be. But I, I, I would be interested to hear what area a national citizen is free of the fear of federal regulation on, because that's something he has a right to to compact with the state government on, or, or otherwise, I, I, I know of I know of no area in which the Commerce Clause, as it is currently understood, uh, would would provide an enforceable freedom in a national citizen from federal regulation. So I, I, I think I might disagree with your premise. We are free, only in the sense that so far. Uh, the Congress has not legislated on a number of subjects, dogs and cats, to my knowledge. It has. Oh, no. It's legislated. <laughs> well, there's, there's the federal uh, humane treatment dog and cat law. You bet. Can't, 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 can't ship them across state lines. Again, they don't touch dogs, nothing about the dogs and cats, just can't ship them across state lines for inhumane treatment. I mean, if you take my com law, I'll show you how this is done. <laughs> I, 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 uh, new information so that I will know now how to conform my conduct <laughs> to, 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 to my federal masters. Appeal, a final topic. We all have to spend more time reading 18 USC uh, carefully, I suppose. Um, your point reminds me of the baseline question that was raised in earlier panels about democracy and, and uh, whether it's such a good thing or not, and the question is compared to what. Our, uh, baseline, I think, here, given the way the panel um, a topic was framed, is uh, compared to um, uh, the visions articulated 200 years ago. What what is the relate? What is the balance between center and periphery uh, today? And the claim, I think, that we're all in agreement is that there's been a qualitative shift um, of of authority from uh, state to, to to federal government um, historically. You properly say that's not the only baseline that you could you could point to. You could point to compared to other countries today, other democracies today. Um, are we that much more centralized? And and um, probably uh, not, especially because even if there aren't limitations on where Congress can legislate um, within congressional legislation, it's often the case that state law often interstitially fills certain gaps. The point is, if Congress wanted to change those tomorrow. Um, it could, but the federal copyright, for example, it's in Article One, Section Eight. It's clearly federal, and yet state law may define who's an author's family, whether uh, adopted children count, whether divorced spouses count uh, for when the author dies. So, but so there, there is some um, uh, more federalism possibly in our system uh, than than in, in other regimes. But the one modification I, I would suggest is there are very few other democracies that extend over so vast a sphere, and this is perhaps connected to the point about whether you can, you can move. Our, our counterpart, really, when you think about it, isn't England or France or Germany, it's Europe. America controls a continent, basically. And this is, again, the geostrategic vision of Publius um, in, in 4 to 8, to create a continental uh, legal system. And there are very few other democracies that, that stretch that far. Um, and so, um, yes, we may be less centralized than some of them, but it's also a much bigger system. 
Your second point is a very good one, that um, you, we should think, in, when we think structurally, not just about federalism, but about separation of powers. I think the basic historical story that some, some of us have been telling is, at the founding, federalism played an important structural check, not just as a parchment barrier, but states were able to protect their interests pretty well until the Civil War in keeping Congress uh, uh, under control, and maybe even to some degree after uh, the Civil War. Um, um, the New Deal period, I think, was so problematic to, mo to many of the people in this audience because federalism was not really a, a substantial check, nor was separation of powers because all three branches after 37 were controlled by the same political party, so there was nothing um, between you and, and Leviathan. Um, since the New Deal, we really, federalism hasn't reemerged as a check, but we've tended to have more divided government, and so possibly the emphasis that we've heard over and over, I, I heard it in Jeff Miller's remarks about possibly separation of powers as a, a structural substitute for um, the demise of federalism as a way to protect liberties. Thank you very much, uh, members of the panel. Let me just say in closing, it's interesting to note that the argument between the federalists and the anti-federalists came at a time when the public was very dissatisfied with the way things were prior to that particular occasion, and they wanted to do something different. Today, we know from public opinion surveys that the public is not satisfied with the direction in which the country is going, whether that's simply a reaction to economic situations or whether that is more fundamental is a real question. Uh, I don't know whether we'll ever see the time, at least in, in our lives, where the public is sufficiently dissatisfied with the direction of the country that they get involved and get excited about structural matters and the principles of government and the kinds of things we've talked to today. But maybe it is uh, true that uh, as we enter the third century uh, as a nation, uh, we need a new group of anti-federalists uh, to raise the human cry. I would certainly suggest my colleagues here to be in the vanguard of that group if we do. The one thing about the Constitution is we do have the power to change if we have only the will. And that really may be the challenge for our third century. To all the panelists, I thank you for your excellent contributions and to the audience for being such an attentive group.